Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today for On a Journey Towards Equity and Inclusion. I'm Marnie Florin. I'm going to be the moderator today for this event, which is part of the I Am Remarkable Week, a global Google initiative that strives to empower everyone, particularly women and underrepresented groups, to celebrate their achievements in the workplace and beyond. I've been at Google about seven years. I'm non-binary and use they, them pronouns. And when I got here um, in my first year, I created a training called Trans at Google. And it's now been heard for over 5,000 Googlers. It is fully self-service, on-demand, scalable. And it was a very sort of grassroots initiative that we pushed forwards um, to help you know, do similar work with I'm Remarkable Week and, and sort of empower underrepresented groups. And so I am so excited to have our panelists here today who have also had their own journeys towards equity and inclusion at their companies to, to make their workplaces and the world more inclusive and more equitable. So let me tell you quickly about our panelists and then I'll have each of them introduce themselves. So we have Anna Viner, who's the founder of all of this. So she is the founder of I Am Remarkable and the head of growth and think with Google, EMEA, ads and marketing. We have Kamala Harris, um, who is the, I should say full names here, um, Kam Kamala Harris, Kamala, not Kamala Harris, I am really messing this up here. Not Kamala Harris, that would be our vice president. But luckily for us, who we actually have is Kamala Avila Salmon, who is the Salmon, who is the head of inclusive content, motion picture group at Lionsgate, and host of the podcast From Woke to Work, the Anti-Racist Journey. For those of you who are familiar with the Grammys where John Travolta uh, botched Adina Menzel's name, I said I wasn't gonna be John Travolta today. And in fact, that is exactly who I've been. So apologies to everyone here. Uh, we also have Katarina Hamaker, who is the head of programs and author relations at Amazon Publishing and is an I Am Remarkable gold tier facilitator. And last but certainly not least, we have Stuart Mills, who is vice president of Trailhead and Ecosystem EMEA at Salesforce. So each of you has recognized the need for more inclusion at your companies and really taken it upon yourselves to make a difference. Please tell me more about some of the work that you do and why you do it. So Anna, if it's okay, I'd love to start with you. Yes, and hi everyone. Very, very excited to be here. We are uh, we have two days to go to our remarkable week. So I'm very excited uh, for this talk today. Um, so my name is Anna Viner. My pronouns are her and she. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about the story of I Am Remarkable and how it all started and um, the impact that, is a, that it's brought to Google and to companies worldwide. And so we started actually, uh, we started in 2016 as a 20% project. So it's something uh, quite unique at Google where you're allowed to pick a project that you can work on for one day a week uh, that is not part of your core job. Uh, and I, me and my co-founder had an idea of how we're going to make an impact on women. Uh, we took a, an internal training at Google, and, and one of the exercises there was to uh, speak about what makes us remarkable. And both of us uh, choked a bit at the, the, the thought of doing that in front of an audience, um, and I think not only that, that we found it really, really hard to say that when I heard other women in that training um, stand in the room and, and read their messages out loud, I felt that they were bragging. And there was something I think I, I got out from that training and I was thinking to myself that there is something very, very wrong with this feeling. Why would I think that they are bragging if the exercise was for them to stand in front of the room and tell what makes them remarkable and talk about their achievements. Um, so we said, okay, there is a really interesting process that people go through. Let's do a video about it and let's build a program around it. Um, so we started small. Uh, I went to my director and I said, listen, we need a little bit of money. We're gonna do a scrappy video to show people the impact of this exercise. 
and my director at the time, she said, Anna, how are you going to bring it to every woman on the planet? And I think at that moment, it was a very big aha moment for me, thinking, okay, let's not think small. Let's think how we're actually going to make an impact here. And I'm really excited to share with you that since that moment, we actually reached over 250,000 people. So I'm going to take a second just to absorb it. It's, it's a big number. It's, it's, you know, I'm thinking I'm, I'm from Israel. It's the size of, uh, of Tel Aviv in Israel. So it's like we trained um, the whole city. And we did that across over 150 countries with the help of over 8,000 facilitators that are volunteering and are running the workshop in their companies, communities, and uh, to their networks. And since we launched, we actually not just targeted women, but as we started running with this program, we saw that the impact of this initiative is much larger than just women. So we since then scaled this initiative to also underrepresented groups. And another group that is really, really critical is allies. So in many of the trainings that we run, both within Google and in other companies and in other organizations, we actually run a lot of workshops also to the leadership team, because we know that in order to really make a difference, we need to change the culture and we need to help alter the culture in those companies. And I'm sure we're going to hear um, from the other panelists here how um, that has happened. Um, so I think this was a very, very important moment in our life. Um, I think the other point where we saw a major impact and we, are, we needed to do a pivot was March last year. Uh, as you all know, COVID hit. Um, uh, well, it started in, in December, January in APAC, and then you know, it moved through EMEA to the Americas. But we, from a fully face-to-face -face initiative, so we had... At that time, I would say probably around 4,000 facilitators who ran workshops. Everything was face-to-face. -face. We didn't want to run that workshop um, uh, online because we thought it's going to really lose the intimacy and the impact. But then COVID hit. Everybody were sitting at home. We had no choice. Uh, so then I would say probably in around 48 hours, we turned around. We prepared a guide for everybody how to run this workshop online, uh, and we got the 4,000 facilitator to switch fully from face-to-face -to, -face to online, which was a major effort, but it really, really paid off. Um, so we see today, I would say probably 98% of our workshops are ran online, and the impact is actually higher than uh, what we've seen in face-to-face. -face. Um, there's you know, a few reasons for that, but, um, but I think... Also, the, the size of the workshop is, is smaller when you do it online now. So uh, we think that ha this has an impact on the quality and, and the impact that we see on people. Um, I wanted to share one personal story there on our online workshops. So I think probably for international, it, it was COVID hit. I think the last day we were in the office, it was around 18th of March 2020, at least for us at, at Google here in London. Um, it was just after International Women's Day, and I had a workshop set to to go and run an unremarkable workshops for uh, female startup owners. And we switched that workshop uh, to online. And I remember sitting in my bedroom and my you know little computer, um, with my baby in the living room. And it was this magical moment of after trying to juggle, do being at, you know trying to work at home with the baby in my arms, screaming and yelling. And she was a year old at that time. Um, and then all of a sudden, this one hour and a half where I could close the door and everybody in the house knew that they could not bother me. And we had this amazing feeling of being together but not at the same physical space, but mentally we were together. And it was just the most magical, magical um, workshop that I've had. Um, and I think the, the connection that we had, even virtually at that time, that everything around the world seemed like, you know, the world is going to end. I don't know, it was, you know, I'm sure that, I don't know, go back to March and think about the, the, the feelings that you had. Um, so that was really one of those moments that I was like, okay, 
I think online workshops are going to succeed and I think it's actually going to work. Um, so uh, I'm going to stop talking now and um, open the stage for others and uh, we'll be back with other questions. Thanks so much, Anna. Uh, Stuart, I'd love to hear from you. Yes, hello, everybody. Um, great to great to see everybody, or to to know that you're there. <laughs> I can see my fellow panelists at the moment. Um, my name is Stuart Mills. My pronouns are he and him. Um, I'm sitting in the Isle of Bute at the moment. I normally work in London, um, uh, down, um, uh, and I work for Salesforce. Um, I suppose the tell me about the work I do is driven by uh, a dream that I have, which is imagine if we could unlock the potential of everyone, regardless of where you come from, what your background is and everything else that might define you. Um, and uh, today I run um, the Trailhead business in EMEA for Salesforce, which is our learning environments and platforms and programs. Um, and through that work, which is um, sort of driven by two things, the business imperative of an acceleration of digital um, and so many digital transformations going on within all sorts of different industries, meaning that we really need skilled people. So the business imperative of that but matched with the society imperative. Well, if you need that many people really quickly, how can you not think about driving into um, diverse communities, giving lots and lots of opportunity? Um, and so it's a joy to work on those, those balancing things. Um, we can talk more if, if, if relevant about what, what I do, but I think the, the why I do it is really that it's a real drive to, to match that business and society in Paris together to make things really sustainable. So just as Anna's talked about, I am remarkable as a program that's reached so many thousands of people today, reaching um, a few million with Trailhead today um, and hope to get many more. And that's just an incredible sequence. So business is important, but the drive that you're trying to make is really critical in that, in that way. And I work on three things. There's that Trailhead bit, I work with building an internal community about entrepreneurship, for people giving confidence um, to each other around innovation. And that was actually where I became an ally of the I Am Remarkable program, which is working out that not everybody feels confident to step up with an idea that they have or to get the sponsorship or backing that's needed to take it forward. Um, and a, a wonderful friend and colleague of mine brought the I Am Remarkable program in and um, I've been just amazed with how it's expanded within Salesforce. And then obviously just as a key consumer of that, just joining the family with Google and Anna, your incredible work that's, that's formed found a, the foundation of this. Um, so it's been amazing to sort of watch that. And it really loops back to, I think that there's a sequence here. It's not about, just about driving in diversity in our own teams within Salesforce, but it links really nicely to the tone that we set within driving people into new jobs around the Salesforce ecosystem and all technology jobs that are possible. Hopefully that's given a little bit of insight into why I do things and it's great to be here. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Stuart. Uh, Katarina. Yeah, thanks for yeah. having me. So I'm also super excited about this panel. Um, my name is Katarina Hamacher and my pronouns are she and her and I work at Amazon for more than 10 years now and currently am head of programs and author relations um, at Amazon Publishing, our um, in-house publisher. And uh, when it comes to what am I doing and why am I doing this, I have to go back a little bit. So when I'm looking back in my history, I was coaching and mentoring others ever since I can tell. So I have even very early, but for sure not fully professionally accomplished from kindergarten even, where I as a five-year-old kind of adopted three-year-olds and helped them get comfortable in the new setup, um, kind of helped them grow um, to the extent what I could uh, coach as a five-year-old for sure. Um, so yet it's not a big surprise um, that I continued this uh, path at Amazon and I invested myself um, across the 10 years in various of our offers like career coaching for young professionals. So we call them career days. We do them both internal and external um, stuff like mentoring through our internal mentoring network or what might be my biggest impact um, up to date um, is um, taking I'm Remarkable at Amazon. Um, to the next level as a global chair together with my lovely um, global chair, Sarah Hackedorn. Um, so just to give you an indication, um, we uh, now have trained more than 100 facilitators with our uh, culture. And 
um, extended workshops from regional only to um, global with more than 4,000 uh, trained participants, uh, which we're really proud of. And the reason why I'm doing this is um, at Amazon, but also in other companies, we see so many powerful teams and voices rising. So for example, at Amazon, we do have um, a lot of great affinity groups like FEN, which is our Black Employee Network, or Women at, which is uh, where women and allies um, organize themselves. But we also have initiatives like Amplify, which is a workshop about inclusive meetings. Um, so a lot of things that you can step up to and, and help with. But I personally immediately fell in love with I'm Remarkable as a workshop concept because I, I think it's so, so powerful. I, I was there as a participant, so I really experienced it from scratch. And I found it was the perfect bridge between lots of things that we are doing at Amazon on our own. So um, when thinking about what I'm doing exactly, um, my main focus right now is to really fuel our I'm Remarkable flywheel. So to attract even more participants, um, acquire more facilitators, to keep the flywheel going, um, working on growing from uh, regional to global. Um, but what I'm also doing together with Sarah is thinking about how we can bring um, I'm Remarkable at Amazon to the next level by expanding what we're doing beyond the bare workshop experience. So we're thinking about stuff like adding in-house best practices, and we're really creating our own universe around the workshop. And so, so that's all pretty technical, but maybe to end also on a personal note, um, uh, Marnie also said uh, that I'm a gold tier facilitator. So I, I hosted more than 30 workshops myself and I still love doing them because they're so empowering. And I also had one of these really precious moments just last week when I hosted a German version of the workshop, which I always enjoy most because speaking in my mother tongue um, helps me to connect even more um, with the, the concept and the, the content. And I had a participant uh, and I asked him if I can share. So he was a pay um, who, who signed up not only to, to help himself grow and get in touch with concepts like imposter syndrome and, and understand how to get rid of obstacles, but he was also signing up because he's an ally. So he was signing up because he wanted to better understand how to better help his girlfriend um, get to her potential because he felt like she's holding herself back and he wanted to understand if there's anything he can take from the workshop to help her better. And when we have those stories, um, that's so heartwarming and, and you immediately know that all the time that you spend on this is, is really well spent and having impact on individuals in the workforce, but also beyond. Thanks so much, Katerina. Kamala, um, I would love to hear from you. Absolutely. Um, hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I've been introduced many different ways, but never as the vice president. So I thank you. I'm Kamala Avila Salmon, and um, I work at Lionsgate as the head of inclusive content and also host a podcast, um, as was mentioned. So for me, um, you know, when I think about what do I do and why do I do it, it really comes back to just sort of like core motivation core motivations and purpose. I remember as a very young child watching a lot of television and really knowing immediately, even just in my child's mind that like, this is so important. This is shaping me. I'm, I'm into what I'm into because of what I'm seeing. And I remember watching things like the Cosby show a long time ago in, in a different world and knowing and seeing how people that looked like me really, really felt valued because shows like that existed. And as I grew up, I thought about, you know, what would it be like to really be able to be empowered to shape what those images are? And how can I bring that message and that purpose to every role that I've had? So I've had a lot of different roles in my career and have come up through tech and media and entertainment, primarily was on the marketing side. And now I've made the switch to sort of be more broadly focused on content and am now really in my dream job. But I think when I think about how I got here, in every space that I was in, I was very aware of the fact that I was one of a privileged few. Any room that I was in, I was one of the only people that looked like I did. One of very few Black people in every business room. One of very few women. Um, and definitely almost always the only Black woman. And for me, as I think about representation in media and how important that is, 
many of us are very focused on what's happening in front of the camera and kind of recognize the importance of what that means. But I think not enough of us are focused on what's happening behind the camera. And what's happening behind the camera is a reflection of what's happening, or rather what's happening in front of the camera is a direct reflection of what's happening behind the camera. Until we change the people who are empowered to decide what images we see, what stories have value, what identities matter, we're never gonna see the full representation of humanity. So I'm really empowered and excited to be a part of that change and really feel like, um, you know, when I reflect on the question of what makes me remarkable, I think many of us look around and see things that are broken and need to be fixed. See places where we don't feel valued and included, but not everyone necessarily decides to make it their business to take on systemic inequity and really believes that they can make a difference. So I would really empower all of you to do that. And just in the spirit of transparency, I was moving so fast that I forgot to start with my pronouns. So I'm Kamala and my pronouns are she and her. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks so much, Kamala. Um, I'm gonna actually come back to our next question in a second because I think all of you are, are very impressive. You've done really wonderful things and so, for the folks listening, I think what I want to talk about is you've done amazing things, but I have to assume that you've encountered roadblocks in your work. Um, I would love to understand what type of roadblocks you experience and, and how you got around them and, and kind of any way that you could frame it for folks listening who, you know, might be interested in kind of who are seeing these broken things and want to take action and, and might not know what to do. So feel free, you know, anyone feel free to jump in. I'm happy to start. So I, I think that um, roadblocks are really an indication that you're pushing on something that really matters. There are no roadblocks to doing things that don't matter because no one cares that you're doing them. So for me and my work, especially anything that's connected to diversity, equity, and inclusion, you're gonna face roadblocks. So I remember um, when I was working on a project at a prior company, and you know, um, a group of us had an idea to really tell a story about microaggressions in the workplace and how they impacted people of color and women and other underrepresented groups. And I will tell you in my 15 plus years doing marketing, working on every type of campaign, working on every type of program with every type of person, I've never worked on something that was as steeply uphill as that. It was a project that was canceled probably 10 times before it came out. It was a project that, probably faced 50 no's on the ways on the way to getting that final final yes and even in the final hour you know one of our final big stakeholder presentations um we were hit with some why are you doing this again and so for me i remember as i was leading the team you know people were getting discouraged and frustrated as was i but i think the way that i've always powered through is that i can see so clearly the vision and why we need to do this and I fully expect that as a mentor of mine said, things that matter are hard. So what I've always tried to do is really try to identify who are going to be your advocates in whatever it is that you're doing. Because no matter how many no's there are, there's usually one or two yeses that you can appeal to. And I think that um, if you do that, you will consistently be able to learn different ways of navigating by borrowing equity from those advocates, by getting advice from those allies. And just by really staying resilient, because it's not about how many times you get knocked down, it's really just about, you know, are you able to get up? And I think on that project, that's where I really, you know, really honed and just solidified that message that I just have to get up one more time than I'm knocked down to actually get there. Just one more time. I love that so much. I need a recording of that little snippet just to play whenever uh, I get, you know, demotivated. Um, so that that's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, I might, I might pop in on here. I think that point on, you know, roadblocks, and actually I'd use the word friction. I mean, I think, you know, anything that you try and move need, has friction involved. So, you know, it's always a challenge. And, and even somebody, you know, I feel like I, I you know, look like somebody who has all sorts of privilege and 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 therefore and you know it's actually everything worth doing has roadblocks right? and and some so i really think that's a really powerful point to work through and um, there's a bit of this which is just maintaining the confidence to know that you're on the right path which i sort of really emphasized quite a lot and and i found that's the wobble i've always had you know when you try and you know i remember my first job out of university 
Um, and, you know, I, I didn't just come in and put my coat on my chair and stay there for the hours that everybody else was working around me. I had other things in my life, I, which I gained real um, resilience from and real strength. I used to play quite a lot of hockey, for example. And, and I loved doing that, you know, and I stayed there for about two years and then I left because it just felt like I was being worn down through the days. And actually, when I turned around, my one of the, the people who did an exit interview as a partner in the organization said, oh, no, we really appreciated your, um, your knowing of yourself, your knowledge that that was what gave you strength and, and performance. And so I didn't regret it, actually, the leaving and moving on because it was the right thing to do anyway. But it was a part of me going, oh. But I also had a conversation with him to say, you don't set the tone for people who are slightly different here that t- do things in different ways, regardless of w- whatever that might be. So, uh, I, you know, I think it is, it's about building resilience and then, you know, knowing that it's worth doing. I think that's, that's a, such a powerful point. Thank you for bringing that. Thanks, Stuart. <clears throat> I might pop in here. Um, so I think when we talk about, and I, and I love, Stuart, that you talked about resilience, because I think that's one of the, things that you really need to harness uh, when you go on that uphill battle Um, and it is sometimes feels like a battle because it's not you know especially when you try to fix things that are systematically um, broken or not working in the way that you think they should be working it means that there are some barriers you need to go through it means there are a lot of people you need to convince that what you're doing is the right thing Um, and I remember, actually, not even before I'm Remarkable, there was, when I was still working in Google and Israel, there was this initiative that I really wanted the team to focus on. And I was, and I remember I had all the right data points, right? I knew it was the right thing to do, but I wasn't able at first to get, to convince people that this is the right thing to do until I got a team member who was sitting next to me. And then she said, Anna, you're doing the right thing. I'm going to help you. Let's go into the meeting together. And I think that bringing those allies, those people that will help you, you know, break that first or open that first door, that from there, everything is going to soar is really, really critical. And I've seen that happening hundreds, well, dozens and hundreds of times when I'm remarkable both within Google and externally, you know, if I'm thinking about Katerina, she's my ally at Amazon and she's the one who really helped me to bring Unremarkable into Amazon and to bring into over 4,000 people at Amazon who are now trained on Unremarkable. And I have to, you know, we never met in person, but I, I feel that I'm able to go and pick up the phone and have a chat with her and see, you know, what we do next month and how we grow it even further. So I say, I think that's the allies piece is is really really critical on different levels. And I think when we talk about allies, it's not just your very senior VP or director uh, that is going to be the one who's going to give you the budget or the sign off. It can sometimes be, it, or many times, it's actually people on your level and people in lower levels uh, that are just at the right place that are going to give you the confidence to push through. And um, so that's probably the most important one um, and then resilience and confidence and I think two other points that really help break those barriers um, or at least for I'm remarkable I think that's one of the lessons that I've learned um, the first one is data and impact information so it's very very hard for people to argue with objective numbers and facts the same way as you talk about your achievements in an objective way the same way which you talk about a program or an initiative that you want to push if you come and you bring objective data, it's very hard for people to argue with that. So I would say always try to move away from emotion and into objective data and information that you can share. Um, and then the other thing that really helps, I would say, is authenticity. So the amount of times that people ask me, why do you do I'm Remarkable? You probably do it because you want to get a promotion. Or you probably do it because you think it's going to... Um, help you get that PR piece. And to all of those people, my answer was always, you know, I do, I'm remarkable because of the impact that we drive on people and the countless emails that I get. And just two days ago, I got a message um, 
from somebody who was just hired at Google. And she said that thanks to watching Unremarkable videos, it helped her prepare for the interviews and she managed to get hired by Google. And I think those stories, and you know, I've been hearing through the past five years, I've, I've heard um, hundreds of those stories. It just, this is what keeps me going. It's not about this external recognition. It's about knowing that you're doing the right thing knowing that you're making real impact in the world. And this is um, what I would really empower all of you to go and do. Thank you. I love what I have heard so far, and, and maybe I can also add my view here. Um, so sometimes we're in the lucky position that we're doing something that we're passionate about and where we think it has impact, but someone has paved the way already. So when we were picking up Sarah and myself, I'm remarkable at Amazon. Um, this has already been brought to us by uh, our um, consumer director for diversity and inclusion at that time. Um, so we had um, senior leadership um, buy in right away. So, so no roadblock to remove there. But this doesn't mean that we, we didn't have to overcome a lot of friction. Um, I, I love that word in, in that context. Um, and had to have a lot of resilience because for Sarah and myself, we're really doing this as a duo. Um, the vision was clear and, and we immediately felt how much impact it can have and how big we can make it within the company. And we immediately formed the team um, because we thought if we want to make it big, we need more people that we bring in. Um, but then at some point of time, we recognized, for instance, that the vision for us in our head was so much clearer than for the other folks that we acquired to help us. Um, and that for them in this early stage, they were looking for so much more input and guidance from us about what exactly to do next, while we were trying to give them really open space, a blank page and maximum autonomy in their work stream. So we really organized work streams kind of from day one on, which might have been a little early um, looking back. Um, and what we had to learn kind of the hard way is that we need to pick up people where they are instead of trying to, to connect with them somewhere further down the journey where they haven't arrived yet and to really openly uh, communicate. And I also love what, what Anna said about the data-driven approach and really making sure that you communicate what the thing is that you're trying to implement. Because while we have had a lot of support from, from uh, senior leadership, um, there were still a few of them who, who didn't get what the, the concept was about because in their career progression um, and, and how they have developed themselves maybe 15, 20 years, um, this was not exactly the workshop that they would have been looking for. So they were rather trying to think about how can we turn this into something that unlocks even more potential on top performers. But we're trying to... Um, enable everyone to speak up, which is a different concept. So there was a lot of going back and forth and, and really communicating what the program is all about. And for sure, this can be uh, a setback once in a while. Um, but as we're doing this in a duo, we're in the lucky position that um, whenever someone is, is getting dragged down a little bit by a pushback, usually the other one is in pretty good mood and uh, able to drive things forward. Thanks so much, Katerina. Um, I heard allyship and allies uh, come up a lot. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious to, to hear more about kind of effective allyship. And, and Anna, you shared a story that reminds me of um, someone's allyship for me. We were at a, a team uh, like offsite. And there was a speaker who was incredible, but she said men and women, you know, constantly, right? And as a non-binary person, I, you know, I was really engaged. And then every time that kind of happened, I just kind of got um, pulled out, right? Pulled out of, of where I was and, and um, a little disengaged. And there was a huge line of people wanting to talk to her and ask her questions because she was, you know, tremendous. And so I got at the end of it and I just was going to give some of my feedback and a colleague of mine, Dorea, came up and said, um, you know, that she had noticed and was bothered as well. And did, and did she, did I want her to stand with me? Right. Just while I was waiting to speak. 
And it was such a small, she's heard me tell this story because it was just meant a lot. It was a very small act, but it really meant, um, meant so much. And, and just, you know, you hear about allies standing by someone and usually you can't physically do it. Oftentimes we're virtual, but that was a really, um, a beautiful moment. And then, um, I don't remember exactly who it was who said, it's not always senior folks. And when we were first doing trans ad, it was um, Sarah Wood, who's now a program manager, but was um, an administrative business partner who said, okay, well, if you're planning a first session, here's what you need to think around, around scheduling. We wanna make sure it's not during like a leadership summit. We wanna make sure it's the right time in the right space. We wanna get the right people to send emails and notify everyone. Um, and the session would never have been what it was if if not for her initial, just really that logistical support and reviewing the material and giving us the confidence and introducing us to the right people. It was so um, clutch. And so I think there's, there's a piece of when has someone been an ally to you? But then I think um, there's also the piece of when might you have fallen short as an ally? And I think that that's such an important conversation. Um, I think we need to normalize being vulnerable about, you know, and open and honest about making mistakes because we don't grow. And I think especially for white folks, there's a feeling of, um, or, or, you know, people, other people from privileged areas of not ever speaking up because you're so afraid of saying the wrong thing. And so I think we need to normalize, you know, doing and saying the wrong thing a bit more. And I can certainly, uh, start with a story where I was going to be working on a summit and someone had the idea of bringing childhood pictures of yourself. And I had said, you know, I think that's a really bad idea. I know there's other trans people in this group um, that might be reliving trauma. What I didn't realize because it wasn't my truth is that if you were adopted and didn't have access to pictures, if you had, um, you know, an abusive or unhealthy childhood that you didn't want to relive, if you didn't have access to cameras or photos. There, there are all these situations where it also would be not inclusive, but that wasn't my experience. It wasn't anything I thought of, right? Because we tend to live in kind of what our own experience is. And so I was asked if I could make my own icebreaker. And I said, yes, of course. And I was very confident that I was going to make the most inclusive icebreaker in the world. And it involved options on the screen and your preference. And if you prefer this one, you walk to that side of the room. And if you prefer this one, you walk to this side of the room. This is years ago. So we were in person and I show up and there's someone on, on crutches that kind of go up to the arm with, um, who had spina bifida. And my entire icebreaker involved walking back and forth across the room. And I was really so sure that this was, that I had thought through everything. Um, but as an able-bodied person, that wasn't something that was top of mind to me. It wasn't something that I thought about and I completely missed it. And I think what I kind of learned from that is that you can never think of everything because you can never embody every identity and every person. And so having sort of other options in your back pocket or checking in with participants ahead of time or anything like that. Um, but it was certainly a wake up call for me. And I've since looked back at the deck and it's not nearly as inclusive as I, as I thought it was. And so I think anytime you can assume you're assuming that you're going to include everyone and do everything right. You got to know that like you're already set up, you know, you're set up to fail because you just don't know everything. Right. And you, we don't know what we don't know. So I'll pause there because I know you all want to hear from the panelists, but I'd love to hear kind of any stories of when someone was a really effective ally for you or on the flip side, um, maybe when you were trying and, and fell a little short in your allyship. I love this question because I agree with you that um, we need to really normalize that perfection is not possible. And I think that there are many, many people who just stay out of it altogether. And they think that it is out of a need to be perfect. But I think that unfortunately, all it does is sort of um, demonstrate complicity with the status quo. The status quo is probably not bad enough for you that it's worth potentially being uncomfortable for a moment or two. And so I try to really push myself when I'm feeling that way. Um, and I love your story too about like how, you know, when we're focused, especially when you're part of a marginalized community, you are you can be so focused and you're just very aware of what that specific experience is, not thinking that there are, there will be a lot of other slices of marginalization that you don't experience. Um, and so I think like 
um, I can talk a little bit about um, effective allyship and also a time when I felt like I fell short. So on the effective allyship front, um, I remember during um, everything that was happening last summer with Black Lives Matter, so many people reached out to me and said, how are you? You know, how can I support you, et cetera? But honestly, most of them were pretty nonspecific. And if you can think about yourself when you're in the midst of trauma, sometimes when someone says, if I can ever do anything to help you, let me know. I'm like, well, now I have to do work to figure out how you can help me. I, I can't do any work right now. And so I, it's just sort of like, thank you, but I don't know what to do with it. So I have a friend who reached out like with a very specific, um, you know, sort of moment of support. And she was basically like, I've been reading your posts about race and your experience for years. And I think they're incredibly empowering. I think that they should be read by more people. And I know you don't have time to do anything more with them because you're busy, you're a full-time mom and a full-time um, executive but can I download all of them and put them together for you and start to help you think through what a book proposal might be? Because I just think that that would be really powerful. And I've never had someone, you know, show up like that. And I just, I've, I've told this story a lot because I think the other thing too, like you said, um, is that when someone does show up for you powerfully as an ally, um, it might be a moment in time for them. And it's something that really will resonate with the person for a long time. And they'll be telling that story. For a while. So I'm, you know, continue to be really grateful to that friend of mine. And then I think when it comes to like times when I didn't meet my own mark, I think that, you know, I try to be very careful with my words. I think words really, really matter. Um, and yet there are absolutely times when, you know, I'll say, hey guys, and I don't think about it, right? I still say, hey guys, and I don't think about it. And, you know, not because I think, oh my God, I'm a terrible person, but I can do better. And like, sometimes I don't remember to do better. And I really appreciate um, when people just point it out to me um, because that gives me the practice of just like reframing every time. So now, you know, even though I can say that I still probably slip up, I think about it, I'm aware of it. And that helps me to be less likely to do it again. And so if and when you say something to someone um, and they point out to you that it's not as inclusive as you intended it to be, I try to really think about how can I say thank you to them for giving me the feedback versus creating an experience that will make them feel like they never want to give feedback again. Because as a person of color, um, I've almost never given feedback on race to someone who's been excited to receive it. And it, it just means that people stop learning. So I try to really be grateful when someone gives me feedback. It means that they think that I have the potential to change. Thanks, Kamal. I think that's totally, um, totally spot on. Thank you so much for sharing. I know we have Q and in a couple of minutes, but I'd love to hear from you know one or two more of you. Gosh, I love this. I mean, it's what what I'm thinking about as as this conversation is going on is um, some words that somebody said to me once, which is "I hear you, I see you," and and then the final bit was, "It's not about me. It's about the person I'm trying to." be an ally for um, and I saw a question maybe coming in around sort of how do you encourage and train people but you know we can talk more depth about that but it's it's really interesting so I you know my in my own role I, I really think about those words and just thinking well actually part of leadership in, in whatever that might mean in your context is being a good ally for somebody else that you hear and see them I'm a um, I've been at an event over the weekend here in um, in Scotland, which was called a business decelerator. And you know, it was a great community event, lots of different people from lots of different organizations. And we were asked to do appreciation at the end. Um, and you had lots of snapped conversations through the through the meeting, but um I was shocked by the gratitude that was put given to me by somebody who who'd obviously seen me and heard me across the two days and was able to describe my strengths in a way that was just disempowering. And I felt, oh my goodness, if I could do the, rever the, the, um, the reverse of that for somebody else, I need to learn that. And, and you know, we had, a, we had a conversation afterwards, one-to-one -one, about that process. And I was thinking, gosh, you know, that was powerful for me. And I hope for everybody you get those, you know, they don't happen very often. I would say that, you know, things like this deep allyship that we've already talked about sometimes aren't that frequent in your life. It really, really matters, but we can all do the little, little bits because it's it was a one minute exchange that mattered, 
um, yeah. um, for yeah. me. Um, I can think of an example of, again of where where I've got it wrong, and it was in preparation for a very large meeting where I hadn't thought through um, uh, the the way that somebody needed to be introduced um, and to properly brief um, my my um, my boss at the time um, with with the name and their role, um, and they completely miss did it on the stage in front of a large group of people. And the person had to walk from front, from the back to the front to collect a ward. It was tortuous. And, you know, just thinking, gosh, if I had, I had a short list of people, it really wasn't excusable to, you know, to have that long list, but it was just, um, it was just a missed step in a way. And I just felt like a lot of, a lot of things have been broken in that moment, actually. And I think this is the problem of it. If you're not thinking about those things about seeing and hearing people, is you can break trust so fast, can't you? And it's kind of like those sorts of things. So, um, you know, I, I try and think of these things. I mean, the only thing is we're not all perfect. And I think where you started is on this bit a bit, and we all make so many mistakes. And actually, if we get too obsessed with language and labeling things, unfortunately, nobody will ever be able to speak to each other. <laughs> and, and that completely gets rid of the whole point of this, is that we are actually trying to be an imperfect human race, trying to do great things together. And so, um, yeah, you know, I, um, th those things are important, I think, to me. Thanks, Stuart. I know I think we're, we're ready to move to Q&A. There's a, um, uh, I think, I think sometimes people do get a little too into, well, if we, we can't label everything, we can't try to make all of our language perfect, right? But I think um, Kamala's, what you said around that your words matter. Um, I like that, you know, there's the Maya Angelou quote, quote, do the best you can until you know better. And then uh, when you know better, do better. And so I think that's really the the idea here because I I worry as someone who for whom labels is very important, I worry that, you know, uh, to say we can get to a place where, you know, it's hard to have a conversation. I think like that's the um that's one side of it. But I think the other side of it is if you can, if you know better, you can have a conversation and be in a place where people can feel safe and people can feel respected and understood because language and actions are are being um are being thoughtful or are, are thoughtful of of them and and their um space. So I I know I know that's not exact I, I know you didn't mean to not be respectful, Stuart, but I think it is something I hear from from the other side of the house sometimes. It's like it's it's too hard to do this. And I think it's not hard, right? You make mistakes until you until you know better. And then once you know better, you do better. Um absolutely. And, and I think I think yeah. I think I just maybe would like to sort of close that because I don't I don't mean don't to try. I mean I think that's absolutely yeah. what you're saying is that we must all try to improve. I think the point is not to be fearful that if you do make a mistake that you can't then take that next step to improve. So no, I very, very much, and I, I yeah. apologize if I, if I suggested that elsewhere, but I, I think that process of learning and continually working out that these things, you yeah, know, very much so. Yeah, I really no, agree totally. with that. I, I, I was just going to quickly add, because I think that like part of what gets in our way, honestly, is, you know, it's our own feelings of how we feel when we are corrected. And I think we just have to continue to train ourselves to just not make those moments personal um, because it really, like when I'm, when I'm getting upset about it, it's my own pride and it's my own sort of, well, I see myself as this kind of person and therefore you're saying I'm this kind of person. And usually the person's not saying that and it's not a character judgment. It's just, Hey, are you aware that like, you know, this was maybe not the most inclusive thing you could say? And yeah, it doesn't feel good, but it feels much better than like making that mistake blindly for the next 10 years and no one telling me. So I really appreciate that. And I know we have to go to questions, but I'm really glad we took a moment to talk about that. Yeah. So we, we have one question about what are ways to train and encourage allies, which I think will be a longer conversation. But Anna, there's a second question. If you could just speak to it quickly around, um, from Lucic Gasp, all the speakers represent big, well-known companies. Are there any smaller companies? And I am remarkable. Diversity of companies is important. So, if you could just speak to that in a minute or so, and then we can come back to that first question. 
Yeah. Thank you, Lucic, for the question. It's a very good question. We haven't talked about it, but Unremarkable has been embedded in over 800 companies and organizations around the world, big and small. So we have startups with five people that have run Unremarkable as a workshop and companies obviously with hundreds of thousands of employees, um, as we can see. I fully, fully agree. Diversity is key. Inclusion is not less important. Um, I think it really is down, especially when you talk about smaller companies, I feel it's it's very much down to the leadership team to help drive that culture. Uh, but I can tell you that from my experience, going bottom up also works, right? So if you feel that you don't have the right support from your leadership, you can, Unremarkable is free and it's open for everyone. So you can be the one who brings Unremarkable to your company and start that conversation that is really, really important. Um, and then you can have more allies to jump on that boat with you and go and scale. So definitely the answer is yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Anna. Um, I appreciate that. So yeah, um, what are what are ways to to train and encourage allies? So maybe I can speak to that quickly uh, from my perspective. So um, I, I think a lot of uh what, what's important we we've heard already um but i think um we we need to encourage everyone to to listen and um as we just heard not to take uh, criticism personal and i see this a lot when when i'm getting hints about what was not uh, super inclusive um because i try so hard to be a good person and then i feel like oh i'm not um and this makes me feel bad um, and the first reaction is really to push back. And I think we need to educate people that this reaction is normal. Um, and that what we get offered from others, if they are so kind to let us know that we screwed it up somehow, um, is it's not criticism, but it's help. Because if, if they point us to what we did, we can do it better. And then the next time someone is listening to us or interacting with us, we're, we're doing less harm to others. So it's, it's really powerful on, on the one hand, if people speak up and let us know that we did something that was hurting their feelings somehow or might have hurt feelings of others somehow, um, but also to learn to, to work with that. Um, and I think what's also important is to, to make people aware that um, everyone needs an ally sometimes. So it's not only about those those occasions that stand out in the media. So for sure, there are things like Black Lives Matter that, that is on, on top of mind for everyone. But you might also need an ally when you're suffering from a mental health disease or when you're new in a team and you don't feel comfortable because you have moved locations. So there are reasons for everyone of us to have support. And that's why we also owe it to everyone else to give support to them. And I feel like if we start this open conversation about uh, feelings also in the workplace and, and um, all aiming for our best, this will change things for the better because the more we enable this, um, uh, and even if it's top down in the beginning, um, we start those conversations and the more open we all get, um, the more we also will encourage vice versa people to speak up if we hurt them. Um, so that's my take on this. I love that. Thank you, Katarina. I actually wanted to add one more thing here. I think when we talk, and Katarina, just building on what you just said, I think making it, normalizing that conversation and bringing, I think, the topics you want your allies to know to awareness. And I think one of the things, or one of the biggest feedbacks we've been getting when we launched our first video for Unremarkable when we showed it to to men at the time, I was showing it to some colleagues in the office, um, to my husband, um, and the response was, oh, wow, I didn't know that this is how you feel. I didn't know that this is the experience that you're going through. And I think that just showing somebody else of how it feels for you or how it feels for different groups around you really makes people understand and be aware because I think we should really assume positive intent in everything that people do. I think if we you know, live in a world where we don't assume it, our lives are going to be quite miserable. So I think assume positive intent 
in everything that you hear with the people that you interact. And I think there is a lot of education and awareness that needs to happen. Um, and that's for me, is probably the best way to bring allies on board. Um, so I think one, one of the quick tips is anytime I'm, I'm getting feedback on anything, you know, that's happening around my, my day job or, or with Unremarkable, I, I actually try to take this opportunity to, to flip the coin back and say, okay, let's work together and see how we can work on this issue together. So it's not just a one-way conversation, but actually let's create a partnership here and let's create um, allyship. Thank you, Anna. I, I always say assume positive intent while holding people accountable. So that's usually, I think, you know, we have to always think about impact, but I think you're going to get to the result of someone realizing where, you know, they may have messed up or caused harm much more quickly if you assume that positive intent that you said, right? I think that's so important, but assuming positive intent, you know, in my mind doesn't ever, doesn't mean that people aren't accountable for the things that they do and they say, and I think that, you know, that's such an important piece. Um, to Kamala, we have, uh, it was lovely to have your thoughts, apologies for the dog. It was lovely to have your thoughts so specific and empathetic. Are there any books that you've been reading recently and would strongly recommend to fresh graduates? Man, um, first, um, I would love to be able to read books um, at this particular moment in my life. Um, working in a studio is really funny because you're reading scripts all the time. So that's the primary thing that I'm reading in long form, as well as having a toddler. But there are a couple of books that I just think are classic and I'm always happy to recommend. So um, a book called Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria uh, by Beverly Tatum is just brilliant. I think she does a really, really great job of talking about the socialization of racism. She does a really great job of give, putting it in context, um, in the American context, in a way that I think is really powerful um, and impactful. I would really encourage people who haven't read that to check it out. Um, and then I think in addition, one of the things that I do do is I listen to a lot of podcasts and I also am, you know, a ravenous reader when it comes to articles and essays. Um, there's a couple of really good ones, um, that I'll just mention quickly. So one is code switch. If you just want to have a running sort of, um, you know, something that will constantly connect you to how is what's happening in the world right now connected to, um, race, racism, structural inequity, et cetera. They do a great job of connecting cultural affairs to wh what that means for sort of race and race relations. And I just listened to a few episodes recently, and they're really doing a great job of connecting the dots of everything that's happening. So I think that that's a really important one um, that I'd be excited for people to check out. Um, and of course, now I have to plug my own podcast, which is called From Woke to Work, uh, which is basically, which is my response really to the last year. And seeing how many people were eager to step in as allies and anti-racists, but seeing how many people were really stuck in the feelings zone and wanting to really empower people to take action. So that's really um, what it's about for me, um, because exactly as you said, uh, Marty, we, we have to respect intent and yet prioritize impact. Totally. Thank you so much for sharing. There was one question about, we have 50 seconds, the importance of and the crafting of a powerful and effective apology. I just want to speak this quickly. I think um, anytime you're saying, I'm sorry, if I did something, that's a no. I think it's acknowledging your action and the harm and taking action towards repair, right? So it's, um, I realize, you know, what I said was, was incorrect or wasn't thoughtful or wasn't considerate. I will do better next time. And here's how I'm going to read this or I'm going to do this. Um, so that's, I think, the best thing. I want to thank all these incredible panelists for being your authentic, amazing selves and sharing your stories. Everyone um, loved hearing from you. Thank you all so much. And thank you to all the attendees of this event.